I'm Chris Richardson, and this is Not A Pipe Podcast. Thank you for joining me today as I interview Liam Burke, one of the editors of the new book, The Superhero Symbol, Media, Culture, and Politics. This collection has things from film studies, adaptation, comic studies, television, cultural studies, media studies, avenues of exploration, all centering around the superhero. A great read for anybody interested, no matter where they're coming from. Liam's been doing some really interesting work in relation to superheroes and popular culture. You'll notice I was talking to my work study student, Molly, about him because she was certain that he was Irish or sounded Irish, but then I was telling her about how I was talking to him sort of a day ahead in Melbourne, Australia. Liam is originally Irish, now in Melbourne teaching at the Swinburne University of Technology and producing some really cool things in academia as well as in more popular and arguably more accessible avenues as we talk about in this interview. So whether you are considering writing about popular culture or just interested in hearing a little bit more about this book, thank you for joining us. And Liam, thank you for joining me. I know it's late where I am and early where you are, and uh, I appreciate you taking the time to speak with me today. Maybe you could start by telling us a little bit about how this book got off the ground, why the superhero symbol was an important collection for you, as well as Ian Gordon and Angela Indelianis to work on over the last few years. So the superhero symbol is our new edited collection. It has the subtitle Media, Culture and Politics. And really what it's about is not just the popularity of superheroes, but the pervasiveness of superheroes. So increasingly, superheroes, whether on page or screen, are weaved into the fabric of political and cultural and social life. That could be everything from someone dressing up as their favorite superhero to bring attention to a particular cause. Or it might be as pedestrian as someone you know, wearing a T-shirt of their favorite character to work. Superheroes have been around, you know, for, depending on your definition, 80 years. They've always been popular, but I would argue that they've never been quite so pervasive. So this book looks at that from a range of scholarly perspectives. So we have everything from looking at the branding of superheroes, very much from a kind of a legal and branding and advertising perspective, to the political economy of superheroes, looking at superheroes and, and fandom, and also looking at superheroes and national identity. So really trying to offer a, a range of perspectives on this increasingly interesting topic. Yeah. As you just mentioned, actually, before we recorded, you were recently doing or taking part in a fan studies conference. And I can imagine that a, at a place like that, a gathering of scholars who are doing similar kinds of work, it would be pretty easy to make that argument that this is an important work that I want to get it out there and superheroes and the superhero symbol is going to do a uh, certain number of things with political economy, cultural studies and such. I'm wondering, though, explaining what you do and what this book in particular does for more of a lay audience, maybe scholars outside of that field, or maybe people who know that you're a professor but don't know exactly what you are writing about or studying. How have you found explaining that and what kind of moves, if any, do you need to make to make sure people kind of understand what you're doing? I'm very lucky here in Melbourne, Australia, because there is an ever-present reminder of the kind of growing visibility of superheroes. We have a stadium in our Docklands, which is now the Marvel Stadium. It was previously the Etihad Stadium, hmm. and it's the main hub of the Australian Football League, which is the kind of number one sport here in Victoria. And last year, Marvel bought the naming rights for that. And... I mean, just to think of other illustrative examples on a local level about how superheroes have become particularly prevalent. The highest grossing films of the last few years in Australia have been superhero movies, everything from Joker to Avengers Endgame to Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. The most popular TV shows could be everything from the, the recently concluded Watchmen on HBO to shows like CW shows like Batwoman and The Flash. Mm -hmm. And then kind of beyond that, you know, we have a growing comic book and superhero culture here in Melbourne. And then even on a local level, a uh, project I've been involved with kind of tangentially is there's an Australian superhero show called Cleverman. And Cleverman takes the genre, the conventions of the superhero, but applies to Indigenous Australian mythology. So it's a way of sort of bringing some of the issues faced by Australia's First Nations people 
to a wider audience through the kind of more enticing or all-encompassing popularity of the superhero genre. So on all those levels, from the things we watch and consume, to the t-shirts we wear, to the stadia we go to watch sporting events, to local reflections on what was once a very American archetype. It's very easy. It's not a hard sell to explain to people that superheroes are everywhere. So then the argument becomes is that worthy of study? And, you know, our argument, and it's been well received, is that if they have weaved themselves into popular culture, but also the contemporary landscape, then that bears scrutiny. And so as part of a larger project we've been working on over the past few years called Superheroes and Me, we've been really trying to understand how superheroes have become part of the zeitgeist. And we've been doing that with ACME, which is the Australian Centre for the Moving Image here in Melbourne. We've had a number of events, including a Superheroes Identities Conference, which is where many of the chapters in this edit collection were first presented. We've done a four-month exhibition on Clever Men, that Indigenous Australian superhero show that I mentioned earlier. We had a VR experience uh, called uh, Superheroes Realities Collide, which took a comic book version of downtown Melbourne and allowed you to fly around as a superhero. Kind of really thinking about how taking that sort of superhero art clip and reworking it in a local context. We've had a number of industry events. We've also spoken to more than 100 comic book fans and creators at local conventions. I've edited that recently into a short film that will be touring some festivals, also called Superheroes and Me. So these are some of the ways and different, well, kind of traditional research and kind of non-traditional research methods that we've used to sort of unpack the growing prevalence and pervasiveness of the superhero. Yeah, I mean, just what you started to say illustrates something that I realized once I started to see your name pop up a number of times in, I think the first thing I read of yours was the Fan Phenomena collection on Batman with intellect. And since then, I've noticed, you know, you kind of alluded to, you're constantly putting stuff out there in, into scholarship, but also into more popular discourses about superheroes. So it makes me want to ask, what motivates this fascination on your behalf and how have you kept going where do you get your energy and where do you get your motivation to continue looking because i think it might be tempting for some scholars to you know look into batman or look into superman or something and then sort of run out of steam but you definitely have not so yeah i'd like to know a little bit about your motivation and how you get the energy and uh, and will to like just look at superheroes in numerous and nuanced ways i mean i suppose to chart that i'd have to go a couple of years back so I did a master's in film studies. That was kind of my first entry into academia and certainly research proper. And this was back in 2005, 2006. And the subject of my master's thesis was comic book film adaptations. So you have to remember that was before the Marvel Cinematic Universe, before the Dark Knight. At that point, probably the highest profile superhero movies and comic book movies would have been maybe Sin City and the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movies. Mm -hmm. So while growing in visibility and popularity it wasn't an obvious topic it wasn't perhaps low-hanging fruit and i did meet a certain degree of resistance to that as a topic but i did that for my master's thesis and that became the basis of my first book which was superhero movies and this was more of a sort of a mainstream book for a wider audience informed by the scholarship but not explicitly academic i interviewed stan lee for that book and that book came out at just the right time because it came out in the summer of 2008 and Summer 2008 is really the year that I often say kind of the superhero movie or the comic book movie came of age because that was the year of the first MCU movies, Iron Man and the Incredible Hulk. It was also the year of The Dark Knight, which many at the time considered a superhero movie for grown-ups. And it was also the year of even films like Hancock with Will Smith, which isn't kind of warmly remembered, but it was <laughs> true its sort of subversiveness and its expectation that audiences were familiar enough with the superhero genre that it could be sort of satirized, just demonstrated a degree of maturity in that genre. And really since then, I feel like Al Pacino in The Godfather Part 3, when he says, just when I'm out, they keep pulling me back in. <laughs> the sense that because I was one of the first people probably to write in a sustained way on the current trend of comic book adaptations, um, more and more opportunities tended to present themselves, both in terms of new movies, new TV shows, new video games, and so on. And then, you know, new publishing and funding opportunities. So I did my PhD thesis on the comic book film adaptation. That became my first proper monograph with Mississippi University Press, the comic book film adaptation, exploring modern Hollywood's 
leading genre, as you pointed out earlier, the edit collection fan phenomena Batman, with Intellect, and most recently, this co edited collection with Andrew Davianis and Ian Gordon, the superhero symbol. But I never really set out to be a superhero scholar. I thought it was an adaptation study scholar who became a comic book adaptation scholar who became, because of the dominance of the superhero within that stream, a superhero scholar. And the way I've kind of kept myself enthusiastic and engaged is coming at it from a range of perspectives. So you're absolutely right. We did the superhero symbol that was based on a conference called uh, Superhero Identities back in 2016. And then we were doing a new conference for 2018. And I said, you know what? I don't want to hear the familiar anecdote that opens every paper, which is two boys from Cleveland created Superman. And not that that's not worth talking about, but we've kind of covered it. So I said, let's go beyond. So let's do Superheroes Beyond. And that became our next conference. And it was Superheroes Beyond the Obvious. So that's beyond America. It's beyond comics. It's beyond straight white guys named Chris. You know, <laughs> Evans, so this goes on and on. And from that came this kind of focus on examples of superheroes around the world, the increasing diversity of representation in the superhero genre, and so on. So I've always tried to come at it from a different, sometimes unexpected angle. So, for instance, in the superhero symbol, I have a chapter on Irish superheroes. And so really what that looks at is how superhero comics, particularly American superhero comics that featured Irish characters, Irish American characters like the X-Men Banshee or Captain America, who was retconned a couple of years ago to be Irish American or probably more familiar would be Daredevil under Frank Miller. How they, these comics tended to perpetuate longstanding stereotypes about the Irish that were originally created in Victorian era cartoons to undermine Irish attempts for home rule. Which isn't to suggest that the American or Irish American uh, creators who were using the stereotypes were using them in some sort of political way, but rather how uh, these conventions and these stereotypes had sort of become masked in their own way, but they still kind of reverberated with this prejudice, even if it wasn't intended as such in a contemporary context. So that's just kind of a different way about thinking about the kind of the, the superhero context. So you think about, to so keep going with that Irish example, you think about a character like Derda. You know, his father is a bare knuckle boxer who, in interpretations, is you know quite abusive to to young Matt Murdock. His mother is this sort of saintly figure. You know, she's actually a nun. And when we first meet her in Frank Miller's comics, she recreates the Pieta, and that stems from this idea about the Irish being either apes or angels, which back in Victorian era cartoons created by the likes of Frederick Burr Upper, who would go on to create Happy Hooligan, or you know Tennille, who was the illustrator on Alice's Adventure in Wonderland that the Irish fell into two categories. They were either demure ladies from across the, the Irish Sea who needed, needed Britain to defend them, or they were kind of Neanderthal-like anarchists. And that, even though the political element of that is no longer relevant, you still see it continued into characters like Captain America, like Matt Murdock, and so on. So it's about finding different perspectives in the familiar example of the superhero, and perhaps not repeating the origin story of Siegel and Schuster creating Superman every single time. Yeah, I mean that's a really important distinction. I think is the the early sort of introductory scholarship on superheroes compared to the more recent, I guess, sort of more nuanced or at least more layered because of the specialization and the previous attention paid to superheroes. And that sort of brings me to my question for you: is in relation to your audiences, maybe you could say a little bit about this book and about other books that you've written. But it seems to me that. It's tempting on one level to write for people who are very familiar with Daredevil, for example, and then in which case you could say, you know, Matt Murdock's father, the bare knuckle boxer, and then people familiar reading that would be like, yeah, I know, I know, I know, like they would be very familiar. And so they might even find like you're, I don't know, you're, you're taking too long to get to the good stuff, the analysis. But then other people, I don't think you can assume are reading with a background knowledge of Daredevil and, and his characteristics. And so how do you weigh those two modes of writing for people who are quite familiar with these superheroes, for example, and people who are interested in the power dynamic or the political economy, but really maybe haven't ever read or vaguely have heard of Daredevil. How do you weigh that in writing as well as in editing in, in this collection? That's a really good question. And, you know, we should, I think, as scholars, try to ensure that we engage a wider audience and that our research has impact beyond journal articles that you need a library subscription to be able to access. So often what I'll do on any research project I have is I will do perhaps like a digest version 
of the particular topic I'm looking at for a more generalist audience, which might appear then in a newspaper or on an academic orientated website like The Conversation. So I wrote a piece, a journal article all about the comparative lack of Australian superheroes and the long-standing reasons for that. And then I did a, a much shortened version of that, maybe about 800 words, as an article for the Age newspaper here in Australia. And in that, I made sure that there was, you know, it was kind of jargon-free, and that, you know, key things were explained. Then when it comes to the scholarship, even though you assume that everyone from the undergrad student to the seasoned professor who are reading your book is some way orientated towards that topic, as you rightly point out, just because they're interested in superheroes doesn't mean they know the minutia of Matt Murdock's backstory. And in those instances, footnotes are your friend. So I would often rely on a footnote or an endnote where I will perhaps explain if whether it's an aspect of the mythology or some idiosyncrasy of publishing that would disrupt the flow of the argument I'm making. And I'll put it in a footnote or an endnote to provide context and clarification. Also, I think sometimes there's a danger uh, when we write for an academic audience for it to be a bit dry or humorless and almost lacking sort of an awareness of the reader. And what I have done in some of my more scholarly books is still have little pointers. So for instance, in the comic book film adaptation, there's a good 30 pages near the start of that where I kind of unpack adaptation theory. And that's not for everyone. Some scholars are super across it. And some, as you said earlier, just wanted to get to the good stuff. So I put in a pointer saying, if you don't want this deep dive into you know, adaptation theory, skip forward to chapter one now. For those who, you know, who are interested in that, keep reading this introduction. So I think there are a number of ways and means that you can speak to multiple audiences, not always necessarily in the exact same publication, but maybe by thinking about publishing through traditional and non-traditional means. And then also within those publications of finding ways to flag, gesture, provide context that doesn't necessarily disrupt the flow annoy people who already know it all, leave people who don't know it all feeling lost or rudderless. Mm -hmm. Building on that a little bit, maybe slightly less important, although maybe not. I was having an interesting conversation earlier this week about writing and analyzing things like comic book heroes and just the idea of a spoiler. Like I think in film studies, it's kind of accepted that if you're going to talk about a movie, you kind of assume that you don't need to worry about spoiling it if people are reading about this movie or an analysis of the film then you can talk about anything. Whereas maybe it's just me and what I've read, but I've noticed a little bit about there seems to be a hesitation for comic scholars, especially in terms of like big twists that come if you're reading a certain series, that they'll either make a bit of a warning or they'll make allusions to it, but they won't actually say what happens. This, I think, again, maybe it's just my, my idiosyncratic interpretation, but I think a lot of fan sites, a lot of news sites do that kind of thing where they'll literally have a spoiler alert at the beginning of an article. Is that something you think about at all in terms of like giving away the whole plot line or are you dealing with things that are on some level so popular that you assume everyone's seen it and that you couldn't spoil it? Do you think at all about like spoiling the conclusion of these uh, stories? A little bit, but not much. If I'm writing for a generalist audience in a newspaper or a magazine, you know, I would definitely avoid spoilers. For instance, I was covering Aquaman. Jason Momo, a film from two years ago. So I went up to the set. It was shot here in Australia on the Gold Coast. So I went up to the set of Aquaman and interviewed the cast and crew. And one of the people behind the scenes told me the whole plot, which I don't think he was supposed to. And <laughs> I, I was covering it for a Mexican uh, film magazine called Cine Premier. Now, obviously, in that feature, I was not going to put in you know, the plot, key plot details, because the film was, wasn't even released yet. And when I do reviews and things like that, I will avoid any heavy spoilers. In academia... Because it is such a torturous road from writing the article to submission to publication, often years, I assume that even if I put in the most recent spoiler from an episode of Watchmen the night before, by the time it sees print, it will probably be three <laughs> years. So I think the expiry date has passed on spoilers in that instance. A probably more tricky thing to do is with students. So I will probably, I mean, there's new material. So I would never spoil the previous night's episode or something for students, even if I thought it was super relevant to the conversation. But also, they're coming to TV shows fresh and new. So I remember one student complaining I had spoiled the end of The Sopranos, even though it had brought, been broadcast 10 years earlier. But they were <laughs> only making their way through it now, because obviously they would have been too young to have watched The Sopranos during its first broadcast. So what I will do in lectures and certain talks is I will put little kind of spoiler alerts and, you know, and say, if you haven't made your way through such and such show 
that we're covering in week six, you might want to make sure you kind of binge watch before then. But in traditional scholarship, because of the lengthy publication time, I don't stress spoilers. Yeah, that's interesting. The differences, like you said, in popular academic and then in everyday sort of teaching or pedagogical settings, the different approaches you might have to take. In this book, in this collection, there are a number of discussions that could sort of be summarized as ownership questions. Who owns these characters and who owns their representations and especially their interpretations, which of course is a much bigger cultural studies question in general. I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about how you negotiate that, because obviously Disney, for example, owns the rights to certain characters legally and could potentially sue someone if they were trying to pretend that, you know, they were selling Disney merchandise, but they didn't have a license to do so. But also, as a number of chapters highlight, people, activist movements, grassroots movements have taken on a certain number of these kinds of images, if not the literal symbols. And then maybe in some more problematic cases, you have things like the military and the police, as you mentioned, taking on the Punisher symbol. How do you negotiate ownership? And what advice do you have maybe for others who are struggling with that question? Do you mean how do I negotiate ownership in terms of writing about it or the pragmatics of getting a copyrighted image? Well, actually, yeah, maybe later, like after we can talk about the pragmatics of copywritten image and that kind of thing for publishing. But first off, I'm more interested in the sort of theoretical approach you take, because like I said, a lawyer could tell you who owns something. But a lot of the arguments that you and others make are about the way that interpretation is sort of fluid and that there's at least on some level as much responsibility for ownership from fans as there is from the corporation that owns it. So how do you negotiate that in a sort of theoretical model? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, to point to one illustrative example from the book, I interviewed Trina Robbins. So for anyone who doesn't know Trina Robbins, Trina Robbins was an underground comics artist. That's comics with an X in the late 60s and 70s, first in New York and then in San Francisco. But she was a longtime Wonder Woman fan and the first female artist on Wonder Woman in 1986. And she is very politically active, and she participated in the Women's March a couple of years ago, not following, not long after uh, Trump's election. And she went with a group of women called Comic Book Women, who all had placards that depicted famous female superheroes. She, of course, had the Wonder Woman one, but there was you know, Sue Storm and Batgirl and so on. And I asked, you know, Trina, how does she reconcile the many different versions of Wonder Woman that are out there? from the good girl art of the 90s to perhaps the more progressive versions we've seen in recent years to the fact that she's using the character as part of an activist or grassroots movement to acknowledging the fact that these characters are owned and are heavily commodified intellectual property. And her view was that you would have to kind of have a degree of self-awareness. You'd have to acknowledge the fact that one woman is a slave. That's how she described her. She's a slave to whoever's writing her in that given moment. So if you have, you know, someone who is a wonderfully progressive, great artist like Nicholas Scott, then you get perhaps the best version of Wonder Woman. If it's as Trina complains, like in the 90s when it became very much hypersexualized, then that perhaps isn't the best version of Wonder Woman. And for Trina, when she wears that banner or sometimes you know even cosplays as Wonder Woman, when she's, a, she, she's of the view that she's a fan, she's ownership of the character. She also feels on a kind of a, on a pragmatic level that DC and Warner are never going to come and uh, hold her liable for wearing that character or having that placard because the optics of it would be so poor. You could, like, if DC was seeming to kind of quash efforts to use these characters to bring attention to social injustices or other kind of causes, that's very poor optics. I feel like there's this uneasy acceptance on the part of a corporation to allow a degree of ownership. Having said that, in terms of a theoretical model, I'm often kind of cognizant of what Suzanne Scott recently conceptualized as the convergence culture industry and what Jonathan Gray has previously conceptualized as policed playgrounds. There are attempts on the part of the owners and the stakeholders to corral fan activity, to give it what uh, Jonathan Gray describes as a policed playground. So for instance, let's take a character like Harley Quinn. So mm -hmm. Harley Quinn is a fan favorite, a cosplay favorite. She became popular, not necessarily because Warner or DC wanted to make her a transmedia star, but rather she was elevated following Batman the Animated Series by a dedicated fan base. Fan base of often marginalized fans, female fans, queer fans, and so forth. 
And then kind of there was this slow recognition as combo characters moved to the center of media industries in the early 2000s, that this character could become a transmedia star. We've really seen that in recent years, whether it's the Marco Robbie starring films or the recent Harley Quinn or rated a streaming service show. But there is an attempt made on the part of the stakeholders to sort of organize and exploit that activity. So you'll have things like Harley Quinn Day. So Harley Quinn Day was an attempt a couple of years ago to inject DC's now annual Batman Day with a bit of carnivalesque spirit associated with Harley Quinn. So Harley Quinn took over Batman Day in the sense that you know, they reworked some of Batman's iconic covers to feature Harley Quinn. And they had uh, in-store signings and giveaways and, you know, invited people to cosplay. That might seem like a very sort of egalitarian participatory action. But actually, if we think back to like what John Fisk says about how increasingly the carnival was banned in favor of official holidays, where it was not a grassroots activity, but rather being imposed on from on high, from stakeholders, from industry leaders and so on. So what things like Harley Quinn Day do is they take long-standing fan practices and they install them in studio or publisher structured events where they are easier to control, commoditize and exploit. So there is this ongoing tension between the kind of grassroots interests and activities and a kind of a top-down imposition of boundaries and structure while giving a kind of an often facile gesture towards participation. And I feel superheroes, to use Alan Sinfield's concept of a fault line text, are ideal fault line texts in that they they sort of are at the right on the, that kind of fissure line where grassroots interest meets corporate imperatives. And we can see these heavily worked and reworked characters. If we look at them across time, location and now screen histories, we can see where those competing interests have sometimes aligned and where they have sometimes collided. And so that is sort of how I go about looking at superheroes as both these sort of end text and also heavily commoditized IP. Yeah, I think that's really helpful. In terms of these sort of amorphous, protean, very open interpretations of people like Harley Quinn, or even more so, I think, like Batman, who's been around longer, there's so many versions out there, even if you just think about sort of like the 60s Adam West to the more recent Batman with Ben Affleck, who's already been changed to Patterson. All these versions of Batman exist, for example. I'm sure, I have no doubt that you have a favorite. Mm -hmm. When you're writing and when you're interviewing people, perhaps, or when you're discussing characters like, for example, Batman, how do you think about that in terms of your preferences versus the object, the superhero that you're writing about? I mean, do you try to step away from that and be, to some extent, objective and talk about the various versions of a superhero symbol? Or do you try to, I guess, to some extent, make a case for why your interpretation of like a harder and grittier or a more family-friendly version would be better? In other words, do you find yourself weighing in as a scholar on your favorite comics, heroes, what have you? Or do you try to be representative of the whole? I mean, as a scholar, I think we all often try and maintain a degree of critical distance. Having said that, when you look at fandom and uh, fan studies, to go back to Henry Jenkins' idea of an ACA fan, the sort of the contraction of both an academic and a fan, and the reason why fans are sometimes the best scholars on these texts is because they have insider knowledge and a particular degree of passion and an understanding of the fan community. It's often not as easy, as you rightly point out, to maintain that critical distance. But think about a character like Batman, who's been in publication for you know more than 75 years. Andy Methurst, when he was talking about heavily reinterpreted heroes like Batman, specifically he was talking about Batman, and he was talking about the conservative Batman comics of the 1950s, where Batman was positioned as the head of a Batman family, mainly to counteract criticisms of his relationship with Robin as a which dream of homosexuals living together, as Frederick Warnham had it, in his anti-comics crusade. So this was the mm -hmm. time that they introduced the first Batwoman and Batgirl and Ace the Bat-Hound and Bat-Might, and it became a kind of a more knockabout, family-friendly thing. And this was responding to the time period. And so Andy Methurst, to chart that transition and reconcile that version of Batman with earlier versions and later versions, described superheroes as a cultural thermometer. And I think that's the best way to conceptualize them. And I think that's why they are so useful. Because if you look at, say, a you know, Pulitzer Prize winning play or an Oscar winning movie, 
they tend to be heavily, heavily sweated over. You know, they take years to come to fruition and they're very self-conscious and self-aware. Superheroes aren't like that. On page and screen, they tend to be produced quite quickly, which means that they respond in perhaps a much more honest and organic way to trends, to anxieties, to social interests. And one of the values of studying superheroes to cultural studies scholars and media studies scholars and so on is that charting that history from Batman's first appearance in 1939, where, you know, he was coming from the tail end of organized crime to how he engaged with the Second World War to, you know, the kind of anti-communist crusades of the 50s, to the camp of the 60s, and so on and so forth. You can kind of track the fingerprints of the time period in superheroes a lot better than you can in more self-consciously produced texts. Uh Superheroes are really useful. And that way, I've tried to be open to all versions, rather than prioritizing a particular version. Rather than saying Batman needs to be this, that, or the other, I don't feel that's my role or responsibility, but rather being sort of attentive to many different versions. Having said that, and as you point out, it's hard to remove your own interests from the equation. So, for instance, it's not surprising that I've interviewed Paul Dini, the co-writer of Batman the Animated Series, for this book, because I'm very fond of Batman the Animated Series. I feel as an adaptation, it was probably the purest distillation of the many different versions of Batman that I've always liked in a particular text. And perhaps still stands as one of the most successful adaptations of not just that character, but any comic book character. So you do tend sometimes to lean into things you like or give them a little bit more attention. But I feel like we do need to try and maintain that critical distance and not just be attentive to, but sort of embrace the fact that these characters have ebbed and flowed and changed dramatically over time. Yeah, I mean, it's funny that the Andy Medhurst chapter that you were mentioning, I mean, he's very open about how much he hates the 50s, I think in terms of the way that it became a sort of hegemonic, heteronormative family. And he's actually very, I find very funny in the way that he describes certain things about the attempt to make it more like leave it to beaver type of thing. And the failure of that, I think, is fair to say from from his perspective, which just makes me think a little bit more about the idea of what could be, I guess, under other circumstances, seen as editorializing. So like you said earlier, you do kind of reviews that I would imagine are significantly different if you're reviewing a film or reviewing a book or something to a scholarly analysis of a film or a book. I'm wondering if you find yourself maybe sometimes writing things and thinking, well, that's too editorial or that's too much my biased opinion or something. Or is there a way in which you think about your style of writing and your style of editing, I guess, for this book, in which certain things make perfect sense and they should be revealed and put out there in an academic work and other things, perhaps, like you said, trying to give a more well-rounded representation of a character, maybe necessitates taking out some of your opinion. How do you think about the sort of editing process, either of your own work or of others? That's a really good question. I mean, I was fortunate on this edit collection to have two co-editors, Angel Dalianis and Ian Gordon. And so the benefit of that was Everything that we wrote that was in the book and everything that was submitted as contributor chapters went through at least two editors, usually three, which meant that if one of our biases was shifting the focus or ignoring counter arguments, that the other editor could usually kind of call that and, you know, advise that, you know, we consider some of those different perspectives. That's one of the great things about collaboration. And it's one of the great things, even though sometimes it's frustrating, of the peer review process in academia generally. But what I try and do even before I get to the submission stage of the journal article, whatever it is, I give it to people whose opinions I trust, but who might come from different disciplines. So I often, you know, give someone from, say, sociology, even though they might not know the characters, they know when an argument makes sense and they know when it's leaning or when it's biased. And that usually works as a pretty good detector for when I tip over from having that degree of critical distance that I described earlier to having too much, as you would put it, editorial oversight or prejudice or preference. It's a bit trickier when you get into more traditional publications. If you're doing a review of a film for a newspaper or magazine, they want opinion. Uh But I still try and always base that opinion, as I would in any piece of scholarship, in something concrete. So, for instance, I did a review of Wonder Woman. Or sorry, Wonder Woman, the the film from back in 2017. And 
I've read a lot around Wonder Woman, like lectures on Wonder Woman. And so even though this was, you know, seven, eight hundred word review meant for a generalist audience, it was still informed by understanding Wonder Woman's sort of position as the you know, the first female superhero linked, as Jill Apari has it in her book, to the suffragette movement and second wave feminism. And so what I think that allowed for was a slightly more informed review, while at the same time still providing a generous audience member with some pointers to know whether it was something that they should go see on a Friday night. Yeah, I think that's helpful. And especially, well, I'm thinking about you and your background, for example, having read about Wonder Woman being quite knowledgeable about her and a lot of the context around her, that would make you presumably like an ideal reviewer of that film. So that makes perfect sense. I'm curious if you have any advice for people who are maybe grad students, maybe working on an MA like you described earlier with your adaptation work and seeing something like your CV, for example, who, you know, you've done a lot of work on superheroes. I think it's kind of intimidating for people to want to enter that conversation because if you think about the comic book nerd or whatever from The Simpsons, he's always putting people down, which I'm not saying you are. But he's always so much in the know about these characters that when Bart and Milhouse or whatever go to see him and read a comic book, he always points out a, a bunch of things that they should have known but didn't. And I think the worst kind of scholarship can simply be that, is pointing out a bunch of things that I know that you don't. And on the other side, though, you do want to make your scholarship in particular rigorous. And so you don't want to, I don't know, anyone who likes Wonder Woman, you don't want to necessarily take as seriously as someone who's gone to the work of researching and writing about her. How do you negotiate, especially in those early years of maybe PhD student or professor looking to write on a character that has, like you said, maybe 80 years of text to look at and therefore who couldn't possibly be familiar with everything? Is there a certain base level you need or is there a certain, maybe you recommend starting in one way and then working your way towards a more a larger project? What are your thoughts on people entering the field of something that's so, so huge? I mean, there is that sort of gatekeeper that's synonymous with comic book culture in the English speaking world, which I think is typified by the Simpsons comic book guy. Mm -hmm. You know, you know enough, so therefore you can't come in. And then I think that has carried over a little bit to the scholarship. And I think new fans, particularly fans who don't look like the comic book guy, so I'm thinking here of younger fans, female fans, and so on, face that scrutiny by the old guard. You know, tell me everything you know about Greenland and otherwise your opinion is incredible. And no, mm -hmm. there is enough to satisfy this severe fans. So I would say ignore them. There's a huge amount of publications on any one of these characters. Wonder Woman, you know, enjoyed her 80th anniversary or is about to. And you could find anyone, comic book guy in the world, and they want to read every Wonder Woman comic because it's not possible. And if you start to factor in uh, Wonder Woman's transmedia appearances, that's doubly so. So what I would say to anyone who's entering the field, with perhaps maybe they got to know a character through their adaptation, but feel like they can't participate in comic book scholarship or fandom because they don't know the comics. Well, nobody knows all the comics. That's definitely the case. And maybe carve out a space that's manageable that you can have a degree of ownership over. So if someone was interested in Wonder Woman and they wanted to really engage with that, Maybe just start with one of the more recent reboots like Rebirth or New Birth or New 52 and just like do a deep dive into that. So I think that's really important. But then the flip side of that is, as you suggest, I'll get a lot of stuff to review, journal articles and books by people who are writing on popular characters like Superman and Batman and Wonder Woman who clearly haven't read the comics. And if they were just ostensibly focusing on a movie or a TV show, that's fine. These characters are now transmedia stars. There's no necessity that you have to focus on the comics. But if you are positioning your work as an all-encompassing study of these characters and you haven't made a meaningful attempt to engage with the comics, then that becomes readily apparent. Sometimes I'll read stuff where people will make sweeping arguments about the comics. Well, well that's actually not true. And it'll become very self-evident that they haven't read the comics. So I think it's about how you position your work. I think it is important if you are going to look at these characters across a range of media platforms, including the original comics, to actually go read some of those original comics. Not all of them, because nobody could do that. 
But, you know, there are lots of primers out there, the best of, the greatest stories ever told, the chronicles of these characters, where you can get a good understanding of the character's early publication history. Also, I think it's important for any scholars who are coming to look at these characters because they're interested in their movies or TV shows or video games to try and also read the comic scholarship. Often what will happen is they'll start writing about perhaps the MCU and they're coming out of maybe from a cultural studies or film studies or gender studies perspective. And they'll make a lot of arguments that have already been made by comic studies scholars in the past. And comic studies isn't that deep a discipline. So it's advisable to go read some of the comic scholarship, the early comic scholarship, everything from Trina Robbins to Richard Reynolds to, you know, Ian Gordon, Pete Coogan, the list goes on and on. Because what you'll find is a lot of the arguments that one might want to make about a movie or TV show has probably been made or some of that early research has been done about the comic book iterations of those characters. So to try and think about that is think about if you're new to the area and you feel like everyone knows more than you, well, that's where you begin. And trust me, they don't know more than you, whether they're a fan or a scholar. And then also it's a case of making it achievable and also managing the expectations of the people reading your work. If you're claiming to be an expert on a character, then people would expect you to write the comics. If you're not claiming to be an expert on a character, but say you're focusing on their video game versions, then there isn't the same onus on the scholar to have read everything. Having said that, I do think it's advisable for anyone looking at even the audiovisual versions of these characters to look at some of the early comic scholarship because a lot of interesting work has been done there and sometimes it's overlooked by more recent scholarship. Yeah, thank you for that. I think that is definitely helpful and works as an encouragement, but also as a sort of caution to make sure you do a bit of due diligence, definitely. What about transmedia? I mean, you're in Convergence Culture. Your book is obviously sort of situated in Convergence Culture and transmedia and these kinds of mixed modal representations of characters. I mean, the first author in the chapter is Henry Jenkins. And so the book is definitely looking at, and it, I think in your work in general, it's looking at characters who do not simply and only fit into visual texts, for example, or into video games or into films. At the same time, it's such a huge world and there are often contradictions. And uh, in some cases, those are readily apparent. And in other cases, maybe they're harder to suss out, at least on a cursory glance. But do you have any advice for people trying to work within transmedia or convergence culture, these kinds of industries where similar to comics, like if there's 80 years of comics, you're never going to read every single comic. I think there's a strong likelihood that you're never going to see every toy, play every video game and watch every, well, maybe you could watch every film, but probably not all, every television series, for example. Is there a way that you found that makes transmedia scholarship more manageable when you set out to study a phenomenon that is literally everywhere you could look? Yeah, it's hard work. I mean, <laughs> if the 11-year-old version of me knew that there were this many superhero shows that I haven't watched, they would consider that a crushing disappointment. But there is so many TV shows now, whether it's from CW or Netflix, or we'll see in, in, in the next year or two, Disney Plus getting into the market, it would be impossible to have seen every episode of Legends of Tomorrow or Iron Fist and so on. So what I try to do when I think about these characters as transmedia stars is to get a sense of it. So I watch a couple of episodes just so I get a sense of what the show is, its tone, the generic inflection of the show, its fidelity to the comic books, how it links in in that kind of jigsaw piece way to the larger transmedia story, whether it's a balanced or unbalanced transmedia narrative. And so I'll get a sampling of each. For the video games, I'll probably watch uh, cut sequences on YouTube, but I won't play the whole game. For TV shows, I'd usually watch a handful of the early episodes, but rarely will I stick with it. I usually watch most movies because they tend to be more manageable. But it's about having kind of a sense of all of it and then thinking about how it fits together cohesively. But we're not expected as both consumers and scholars to have read and seen absolutely everything. I mean, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, to use the most prominent example, wouldn't work if it absolutely demanded you saw every episode of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or Cloak and Dagger or Runaway. Mm -hmm. Rather, it rewards those who have made that extra effort, those avid consumers, the fans, with occasional Easter eggs or nods or references. 
So it could become a more intertextually rich and rewarding experience for those avid consumers who have done everything, but you are meant to be able to understand them in isolation or at least enjoy them up to a point. That is why the MCU has succeeded where other attempted transmedia franchises, including The Matrix, uh, ultimately failed. Even though there's a lot of content there, they have a degree of autonomy. and They're not so dense and impenetrable. You know, a newcomer can't go to them and understand. So yes, I mean, you think of something like Avengers Endgame, it's the highest grossing film of all time. So therefore, logically, a good chunk of that audience never saw Ant-Man and the Wasp. But they get what a superhero is, and this is the guy who grows small or grows big. They probably saw a trailer first, and that is sufficient for them to consume it. And for us as scholars, we might go a little bit further, but again, it is sufficient for us to get a sense of these characters as a larger transmedia franchise. And I mean, to go back to one of your earlier points about feeling like, you know, meeting a comic book guy and feeling like you don't know enough. One of the benefits of these transmedia franchises is it sort of levels longstanding hierarchies that place the comic books as the unquestioned or text and everything else was derivative or secondary. Because when you have characters who, like, say, Harley Quinn, who actually first appeared in an animated adaptation and then was only retrospectively reverse engineered back into the comics and now appears across multiple media platforms, well, then anyone who comes to a character, whether it's from the Arkham video games, the new streaming service show, the Margot Robbie movies, has equal rights to the status of fan. And you can't go, well, that didn't happen in the comic books, because you go, well, actually, she's not originally a comic book character, much like Jimmy Olsen, Kryptonite, before her, she's something that's been reverse engineered back into the comics. And this transmedia era, the extensions practiced by conglomerates like Disney and Warner Media, level the old, the, what comes first, the book, the play, is the unquestioned source material. And it allows for a more egalitarian mode of adaptation. And with that, allows for fans and indeed scholars to come to these characters from any number of media platforms and indeed any number of perspectives. Yeah, that does seem actually the way that you phrase that a lot more empowering or a lot more open, which can be welcoming, I guess, uh, as you said, for people who aren't necessarily as familiar with all of these kinds of things. It seems also that even though it's a relatively new discipline or part of a number of disciplines, I should say, you know, comic studies, fan studies, and a number of other things related to cultural studies, there does seem to be quite a bit of work going on now, yourself included, doing comics and doing superheroes. What have you thought lately, if you care to share, if you want to keep it a surprise as you work on it, that's fine too. But what have you thought about lately that really needs to be looked at more, thinking, I really wish someone would, would look into this, or I really wish more work would be done in this area of superheroes? I mean, there's a number of areas. What we're looking at next is something I referred to earlier, which is this idea of superheroes beyond. Beyond the low-hanging fruit and obvious examples that have been heavily, heavily analyzed. So, for instance, our new edit collection, not, not the one we're currently promoting, but one that will be out in a couple of years, is titled that, Superheroes Beyond. And it looks at, say, how superheroes might be used around the world to respond to local kind of politics, cultures, and interests. There's a section on that in this book, but we're really trying to open that up. And so I used the example earlier of the Australian indigenous superhero show Clever Man. I also talked about how superheroes have represented Irish and Irish Americans. There is now a growing comic book industry in Ireland, which has its own kind of cadre of costume crime fighters. And so what I would like to see is Thinking about the idea that the superhero was once this American archetype you know, created at the tail end of the Depression to respond to the challenges of modernity, unambiguously American, like jazz or baseball. But now in this increasingly globalized world with its you know, transmedia paradigms, they have become international icons. And while the American characters, the, the Wonder Women and Deadpools and so forth, are very popular around the world, we are increasingly seeing, whether it's on page or screen or even in things like cosplay and conventions, responses to this kind of American archetype. And what is it about how those individual regions and cultures and nations use the superhero that speaks to their relationship to the states, their relationships to popular culture on a global level, and to local interests and anxieties? So I really want to see there's a, a greater focus on kind of superheroes beyond. 
and even beyond before 1939, beyond white dudes, beyond, you know, so just beyond the obvious. And so I, th- and I think we're going to see that. We're looking at a bit of an R-rated collection, but I feel, having just come from a fan studies conference, that there is a generation of new scholars, a diverse array of new scholars, uh, diverse in their disciplinary perspectives, but also just diverse in their own identities, that will bring those fresh perspectives and that we will have a more kind of balanced and rounded understanding of the many different ways the superheroes can impact media, culture, politics, and so forth. Well, Liam, I think that's such a great way to wrap up this conversation about your book, The Superhero Symbol. I mean, it gives people, the book itself gives people a lot of things to think about from a number of views, but also sets people up, I think, in a way to want more, to anticipate your next book project and to uh, keep an eye out for the work that you and others are doing. I have to thank you for spending the time speaking with me today about it. Great. Thank you so much. And thanks for, it's great to discuss the book in detail and hopefully uh, some of your listeners will seek it out. For sure. Once again, thank you very much for listening to and supporting This Is Not A Pipe podcast. Make sure to check out tinapp.org to see Liam's book recommendations and other info that you might be interested in. Always much appreciated when you share and comment and pass on these interviews. I love doing them and I love getting the feedback from others about them. If you have any ideas, don't hesitate to send me a message via the website or on Twitter at Not A Pipe Podcast. Let me know who you think should be on the show next and I'll definitely try to contact that person and see if they're interested. Until next time, I'm Chris Richardson. Cheers. Cheers.